All right, welcome back to Design a Computer from Scratch. In part one, we picked an FPGA card to build the computer on. It's an inexpensive solution, about 30 bucks with the card and pretty much everything you need. In part two, let's take a look at the architecture of the CPU we're going to design. And I have a personal philosophy that the application drives the architecture. And the type of target application that we want to do is a very typical sort of application where you move data between 8-bit peripherals. This would typically be done in something like an I.O. processor, an input-output processor, where you pick up something maybe from a UART and write it out to a screen or something of that sort. Uh, we'll be able in the end of this to have a peripheral set that already exists and it's in the form of parts from Grant Cyril's multi-comp project. Uh, it's beyond the scope of designing the processor to design the peripherals but inside of multi-comp Grant has a UART buffered UART and the card already has the USB to serial, so it, it's already pretty much there, ready to go, hardware-wise. And all we really need to do is to add that component. Grant in that project also has VGA monitor that is a uh, character-based. You write to a location, and it puts a character up on the screen. And we could use that as well. It's uh, formed in the same sort of an interface as the UART. It's an, uh, an ANSI standard design. So that would make a nice little peripheral. And just between those two first two items there, you could have something that would read from the UART right to the VGA monitor. And with an addition of a PS2 module in software, and there is no hardware support here, so it would be a couple of wires and a connector, you could have uh, other half of the terminal which is typing and going out to serial and that would just be a few lines of code on this card when it's done you don't have to throw another processor on it and it would be fairly simple to code the other thing we're going to do is since it's largely going to be designed to be an 8-bit mo data mover is to have a very small address space and that's the IO address space that is they'll have a nicer sized program space but the I.O. space will only be 256 locations. So that puts the I.O. space in 8 bits, the address of 8 bits, and 8 bits of peripheral data. A little more thoughts on the design philosophy behind this FPGA-based CPU. Is a wider instruction set than 8 bits is super easy in an FPGA. The cost of wider instructions is memory cells. But remember, with this FPGA, we have 56 cells of 1K by 9, or we'll call them 1K byte cells. So there's plenty of cells left over for whatever you want to do with the FPGA. The opcode uh, field width, well, that the opcode itself breaks down into separate fields, but the opcode part of it determines the number of instructions. So just as a target here, we're going to go for a small instruction set of just 16 instructions, no more than that. And that would be a 4-bit opcode field, uh, which consumes a nibble and is fairly easy to code for and deal with. Instructions wouldn't take multiple locations in memory. They would all be reduced instruction set in one word. Uh, one or two accumulators in a 6800, 6809, 6502, that type of machine, those just require a ton of shuffling in and out of the accumulator, and it's really just a lot more work than it's worth when you're dealing with an FPGA because you could build a fairly large register file without consuming a lot of resources. Of course, each register would consume eight uh, register <laughs> registers each that's eight bit register would consume eight physical registers so it would add up but there's plenty of resources in this FPGA to do that so let's build it with a register file and also pick a nibble for the register file select so we'll accommodate up the 16 registers we're not going to implement that many but it'll be there as a facility in case it needed to be and 
since we're dealing with 8-bit peripherals, we want to be able to load immediate data that's 8 bits wide. So that pretty much puts us at uh, the width we want to be 4 bits for the opcode, 4 bits for the register select, and 8 bits for immediate loads would be a 16-bit instruction. So how's that going to look? Uh, that's coded up here as the first 8 bits. Most significant 8 bits are the opcode. Next 4 bits are the register number. And the 8 bits below that are the immediate value. And some typical instructions where we're going to implement or want to take a look at implementing are to load a register with an immediate value. So that would have a particular opcode, the 4-bit register number, and the 8-bit immediate value. An I.O. write from a register, again, would have the opcode for the I.O. write instruction, the register number, and D0 through 7 are the peripheral address that we're going to write to in I.O. space. Uh, this isn't out of the program space. Program space is completely different from the I.O. space. It's not a unified address bus like you'd find in 6502 or something like that, but the program space is completely internally located. Uh, well, the peripherals are too, but it's separately connected up. So similarly, an I.O. read would be the same format, and an opcode like an AND, the register with an immediate value, would be very similar as well. One of the things that we're going to need to be able to do is to do flow control. So of course we have to be able to jump. That's the most obvious. You don't have a program if it just runs through a line of code and stops. And even stopping, you probably just want to jump to yourself. But real flow control is the ability to conditionally branch based on the results of some operation like an AND. So for instance, for a 6850, you would read the status register and it with one which maths out all the other bits and loop until that bit either clears or sets depending upon what you're trying to do. Uh, so the thing we'd like to do really just is to check the result of the end. Did it result in a, in a zero or not? And be able to branch on the result zero or branch on not zero. We could just reduce it with one which is branch on zero and do jumps, but We'll just do branch on that zero while we're here. Yeah, it does use one more opcode, but we'll have plenty when we're done. The arithmetic logic unit, well, we need an arithmetic logic unit, what's commonly called an arithmetic logic unit to perform our single and instruction we're looking at. But it easily could be expanded to do other operations. Uh, we'll probably do an or somewhere along the way here, bitwise ands and bitwise ors. And that ALU really only does two things. It produces that result, but it also keeps track of a zero flag to tell you whether that last operation that used the ALU was zero or not. And that particular bit will stick around until the next ALU operation. Even if that's a bunch of lines co of code later, it will still stick around. It only gets set or cleared when the ALU instruction is executed. Uh, program size uh, branches uh, aren't going to use the register field, so that field comes available for branching or jumping. Uh, branches could use then the full D11 down to D0. I just think messing around with pages isn't worth the effort. This whole thing with zero pages and branching within 256 bytes just makes so many complications on your code that it really isn't worth it. And we have a 16-bit instruction. We only need a four, the 4-bit four opcode from the top, which leaves 12 bits for branching or addresses. But that does produce a program size limitation of 4K words. Remember, a word is 16 bits. And that address there would be in 11 down to 0. And that's plenty of room for I.O. control operations. And reasonable for consuming space. If you had 8K words, that'd be 6 or 4K words would be 8K bytes of, uh, of logic uh, memory cells inside the FPGA. 8 over, out of 56, even there, wouldn't be a big hit. So that's, that's how we'll do branching and jumping. So, so far for opcodes, 
we have uh, load register immediate, we'll call it LRI, and register immediate, ends the register in register number with immediate. I O write, I O read, jump to an address, branch if equal to zero if the last ALU operation result was a zero and branch on not zero. So a uh, fairly minimal set, but enough to do peripheral programming for sure and move stuff between 8-bit locations. So for a simple application loop, it might be, as I mentioned, reading a UART status register, waiting for device present, and branching if it's zero, the data is not present yet, back to the beginning. And once you pick up, once you find out there is data present, then picking up the data from the UART writing it to the video display unit and then repeating forever so that's actually a full featured application and it's a very useful function but we're going to start out with a much simpler application wait for it, it'll come up so what pieces do we need to design to have a operational CPU well for uh, the CPU we need a program counter it tells us where our currently executed instruction is located we need a register file supporting up to 16 8-bit registers. We'll start smaller and make it so it's easily expandable in the way we have it designed. Uh, we won't have to move around chips and wires. We'll just add a few lines of VHDL code. We need a ROM space for the program. And FPGAs are very good on accommodating that. We need a peripheral bus interface for that 8 bits of address, 8 bits of data out, 8 bits of data in, and control lines. And we'll need the control and opcode, control timing and opcode decode section. And the last thing we'll implement in the core of the processor here is an arithmetic logic unit. By the time we're done with all that, we'll have a, a fully functional, albeit minimal, CPU, but it'll, it'll work and it'll move data between peripherals, mostly of the variety of pick up something, test the status, do something. Uh, more details here, the program counter is a 12-bit program counter, and it needs to load to zero at reset. Uh, perhaps in the end, we can use the button to reset the CPU if we want to run it over again. Uh, there's a couple of controls for the program counter we'll need. We'll need the increment counter, and that would happen at the end of an instruction to increment the counter for the next address to be run. But if we're doing branches or jumping, we need to be able to load that counter with a particular value, and that value was found in the bottom 12 bits of the instruction data uh, itself that we showed earlier. Uh, because branches, as I mentioned, are going to use 12-bit absolute addresses. So it won't have to do a relative ad address calculation. You have to do relative address calculations when you have paging in smaller sizes. But we can lit have a literal address always for the next instruction because it fits in that literal 12 bits. And the program counter itself it would have a small logic cell usage. It's not a very complicated counter and they're sort of optimized for counters. The next thing we need for the is the register file and one of the simplifying assumptions we have in this instruction is that there's no register to register transfers which means the same register that was the source for the data of ALU operations is also the destination. So if you end R0 with 1 it will be place back into R1. It doesn't get moved to R2. If we did anything else, we'd have to have multiple register fields in the instruction and uh, not necessary for this particular CPU design. Opcode bits D11 down to 8, select which register is read or written, so that's a pretty easy to de decode and select. And multiple clock cycles will be, re be required for the processor to read and write the ALU result back. You read it on one clock, write it back a clock or two later. And that'll also have implications for the timing control block. And the instructions that affect the register file are IO reads and writes because all IO reads and writes will be into and out of registers. 
and all ALU operations are tied up with the registers. Uh, program ROM, Altera has a ROM wizard built into it, but there's a complication here, of course. And the complication is that we need to create the initialization for that ROM, the ROM file. And we'll put together a little assembler here for this and make a nice little assembler that cleanly makes sim the simple code that this FPGA needs. It'll be written in Python when we get to it and it will be available on the GitHub. Uh, one thing that's a little bit of a complication is that the ROM has registered address inputs. So you present the address and it's a clock later until the data is available out of the ROM. And we have to accommodate that in our instruction queue or the instruction timing. Uh, peripheral bus, uh, the eight bits of address for the peripheral bus come directly off the instructions D7 down to D0. Again, no calculations involved here. And data only goes in and out through the register file. So the register number is selected by those four bits, D11 down to D8. Eight bits of separate data in and out connections. It'd be a little bit complicated with a real 6850 because you have a tri-stated bus and all the devices are tri-stated but that's not necessary in the FPGA. We have a separate data out and data in path and doesn't need to be tri-stated. Uh, input devices are multiplex, output devices are broadcast to all and you produce a chip select for whatever one you want to write to. So not having a tri-state internally, it's just not necessary with the FPGA is a nice simplification for things. Most peripherals are going to need a right strobe, and we'll make that right strobe one clock wide. And a read strobe, um, we'll make that two clocks wide. It'll be more convenient when we get to it. Uh, the right date is valid if it's a uh, uh, rising edge. Uh, the right date is valid usually on the falling edge for these designs, but it could be um, either way because the data will bound the strobe. The arithmetic logic unit is only currently going to be used for AND register immediate instructions. Uh, as I mentioned, it could easily be a, 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 added to with an OR immediate or an AND register to a, with an immediate to do an AD. Not having an AD facility is not a huge penalty. If we want to do timing and do counter loops, we can do that easily with an external peripheral. But it could be added easily and there'll be plenty of room left in the instruction set opcode fields when we're done for additional instructions. Uh, let's see the 8 bits out plus the Z bit with the ALU. So the ALU has two 8 bits, 8 bit inputs. One of them is the immediate value that comes out of the instruction itself that's in D0 to D7. The other input to the ALU is the register that's selected from that D11 down to D8 bits of the register file select. And the AOU produces out those 8 bits plus that Z bit, the 0 bit, that tells you that the last operation you performed was 0. So, as I said, we're only going to do the end register immediate to start with, but the others could be added easily. Uh, the control and opcode decode section is always the most fun part to me. Uh, Determining the timing can be complicated, but this timing will be very simple. And we'll take a look at how to do that in a fairly safe and glitch-free way. But uh, the sorts of things that this control section will have to do is to increment the PC or load the PC. Uh, it'll have to set the Z-bit for the ALU, and it'll have to do the write strobes for the load registers of the register file. Uh, there'll be other controls it has to do, too in peripheral strobes as well. The FPGA itself has a 50 megahertz clock, which is a 20 nanosecond period. It requires multiple clocks for our instruction. One of the things I mentioned was the ROM address to data prop delay or clock to queue timing. The PC increment as well. If you hit the increment, it won't increment until the next clock. 
So we'll we'll make a very simple, uh, maybe not so simple, but fairly simple, two-bit gray code for our instructions. So the instruction will take four clocks. Uh, you can sort of guess on the performance here at this point. Then it'll run around twelve, uh, run at twelve point five MIPS. It won't run at any different speed for any type of instruction. Everything is that same speed. So twelve and a half MIPS is nothing to sneeze at for a little FPGA. CPU definitely better than what you could do on a breadboard computer and because we're coding it in gray codes a gray code is a counter that uh, doesn't count one two three four it counts zero 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 one 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 zero and if you notice very carefully there's only a single bit change between any of those two fields like if you did a counter and you were counting from two to three it would go zero one one to one zero zero and two bits would change so <clears throat> you can't really do decodes off something that's two and three because it would be glitchy but here we can decode for adjacent states uh, quite simply by only looking at the right register or the only right gray code bit if we wanted something that was on in those two bottom states it's only looking at the bottom bit of the two bits the 0, 1, and 1, 1 would be just the X1 state. So it's very easy to make glitch-free decodes with the gray counter, and you just won't have trouble doing it. Uh, design methodology for this will be to design each element as individual VHDL files, and we'll have a top-level entity in VHDL that combines those. Uh, some of them will just be trivial enough that it won't be worth making a lower level entity for it but some of them will be trivial and we'll still make a lower level entity because you might want to expand that lower level entity and after we do all that we'll probably add a top and above that top and make it the new top that has the connection for the peripherals but in the meanwhile we'll just throw the peripherals down in the CPU section we're going to do some small peripherals as we go along here uh, this is sort of application specific, that top that you would put above that top because it would have the peripherals that you need. If you want a UART, put a UART in there. If you want a video display unit, a VGA, ANSI terminal, you'd put that in there. Um, you could put whatever sort of peripheral, 8-bit peripheral you'd like. Well, the first application we're going to do is, and we're not going to have this running. Well, we'll have it running probably in section seven or eight, we could have it running by that point. But basically the first target application and a thought here is to read the key, uh, just like we did when we made the part one demo where you press the button and it lights the light. We wanna do the same thing here, but we wanna have the CPU read the key and write it out to the light. It won't be impressive to your friends, but you'll know what's going on inside of there that it's a CPU reading the key button and the CPU writing out the LED and not just the wire. And for that, the we always would have to have a simple application memory map and that in this case at address zero when we do a read that bottom bit, the D0 bit would have the key and a write would have the LED. So fairly simple hookup and application. I'll probably get that running later on in this series. What does that code look like? Well, if we're going to code that, it would have a label for the loop and a IO read of register zero from location zero. That's what you see when you see here. IO read is the IOR. Reg zero is the destination for that read and the address is zero. Same thing for the right. We don't flip the syntax, but a right is take the value of register zero and write it out to location zero and then it would jump forever so that's an easy test and we already have the entity from part one for that so we're already halfway there we've already created the pin list if you want more information you can see our wiki pages for these products and we have YouTube videos on them as well we have a store in Tindy where we sell all of our cards Thanks for watching our video and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.